Guys, welcome to Video Game News, our first ever episode on this. We're going to be covering Nintendo, PlayStation, Sony, Xbox News. Obviously, we're primarily the Nintendo channel, but hey, we're going to cover the whole industry with this show and focus on the stories that matter most to all gamers. And we got to start with this really interesting one coming from Sony's Jim Ryan, or should I say PlayStation and Sony's former Jim Ryan, because he's no longer employed by the company and is now officially retired. But... In his whole retirement tour, and it's been quite a tour through Sony, lots of parties and shindigs, and look, the guy's been working for PlayStation since before the original PlayStation came out, so I guess working for Sony since before then, whatever. The point is, he's been the head of PlayStation for a hell of a long time, and Sony's been under a lot of fire over the last couple of years, and he's been taking the brunt of it. Well, in his final day working at Sony, he ended up doing a podcast, the official PlayStation podcast hosted by, well, employees of PlayStation, and it basically was a jerk-off session, for lack of a better word, for Sony's Jim Ryan, and one of the things he did put out there, though, is a very interesting piece of news. Like, hey, look, the guy worked there for a long time. So regardless of what you might think of PlayStation today and some of the business decisions made and going into more live service games and microtransactions and all that stuff, bottom line is he's been there for like 30 plus years. So he's been a really big figurehead in this industry for a long time. So I do have respect for his career. One thing he noted, though, in talking about some of his you know, favorite moments from his career was updating the sales data for the PlayStation 2. Now, if you're a Nintendo fan like me, you probably think, well, he's clearly updating the sales data for the PlayStation 2 because the PlayStation 2 is being encroached on by the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Switch recently basically crossing 140 million units, and now it's going to start creeping closer and closer and closer to that 150 million mark, passing the Nintendo DS, and pretty much passing PlayStation 2 a little bit after that. So some people are taking this as, well, on his way out, he wants to give one less chance for PlayStation 2 to maintain its number one spot. Or you're just going to look at this as, hey, he just thinks this is a really important part of his career with the system that sold the most units. Now, depending on where you go on the internet today, you're going to see that the PlayStation 2 is quoted as selling 155 million plus units. Now, that is the last official statement from Sony, 155 million or more. Now, besides that, you'll see a few sites that say 159 million. You'll hear some insiders such as Nate the Hate put out there that it's sold 160, but none of this has been official. 155 was the last time Sony even talked about this stuff way back in the day. Well, not anymore. We have an official number coming from the now former president of Sony Interactive Entertainment, AKA the PlayStation guy, Jim Ryan, and the PlayStation 2 has now officially been updated to 160 million units. Now again, could just be a last chance grasp to keep PlayStation 2 as the number one selling platform of all time on his way out the door. And it might work or it might not because we don't actually know what sales for Switch are going to be for over the next two years because that's probably when Switch would end up passing it. Then again, if Switch is still made and sold for the next four or five years as a cheaper secondary system to the next gen Nintendo platform, then eh, you know things could happen there as well. Remember, PlayStation 2 took a long time to get the 160 million mark and was boosted by the fact that it could play CDs and DVDs. A really big deal back then because DVD players were more expensive than a PlayStation 2. And you could play music CDs with the two, so you combine your boombox and DVDs and video games in one platform. That was revolutionary at the time. So, great credit to Sony for creating a platform like that and making it affordable for people. But 160 million, man, it's a lot. We'll see if Nintendo Switch has a chance to actually get past it. Now, speaking of getting past things, we need to get past something that has already happened in this industry, right? Activision Blizzard King is now officially owned by Microsoft. The FTC tried. It's trying to appeal and do its thing. Look, it's a done deal. Microsoft owns the company. Bobby Kotick was kicked to the curb. Good riddance. And now we got to talk about some of the studios that were maintained in this merger or part of this merger or ownership or whatever you want to call this. Well, here's the deal. Toys for Bob is no longer one of them. Now, Toys for Bob announced back on February 29th that they were going independent. And this is really Really big news for Toys for Bob. I, I kid you not how big of a deal this is because the reports before then were that Toys for Bob might be getting closed. They were sending employees home, having them do this whole work from home thing. And in the end, Toys for Bob was not in a very healthy place. And it seemed like things were pretty dire after the Microsoft acquisition. Now, before Activision had like kind of transitioned them from working on Spyro and Crash into working on Call of Duty, right? They just put everything on Call of Duty. Everything's 
all about Call of Duty. Well, we don't know the specifics about how they were able to become independent. Uh, were they able to put up money to buy out themselves? Uh, did Microsoft just grant them the ability through this merger? Hey, we're not really interested in maintaining your company. We are going to offer you to maintain yourselves as an independent studio, or we're going to close you down. We don't really know, and we might never know the particulars, although I suspect questions will come up in a future interview. But what we do know is in that blog post when they announced they were going indie, that they actually said their first game was going to be made in partnership with Microsoft, which that makes a lot of sense, I suppose. The company that you just freed yourself from is still the company you're going to work with. But then again, chances are when they went solo, they didn't maintain any IP rights. So the games that they have been working on for a long time, like Spyro and Crash, are Microsoft IP. So if you want to keep working on those, you're going to have to work it out with Microsoft. Now, this is a Spyro 4 rumor, and I just wanted to give you some of the context of how we got to where we are today, because we have some information, or at least a rumor about the Spyro 4 stuff coming from a YouTuber. And this YouTuber is called, hold on, let me, let me get this right. I, I'm, YouTuber Canadian Guy A. Hold on, let me, that doesn't sound right. This is Canadian, right? The Canadian guy, eh? Uh, something like that. Don't ask. I'm not Canadian. I don't know what's going on. Them and their flapping heads. But uh, yeah, he's a mega fan of the franchise, a mega fan of Spyro. So that's kind of his context. Now, he's never been the source or a big deal in the rumor mill or leak space before. So this is kind of one of his breaking into it things. Look, I don't really know. I don't know anything about this guy, and I hold no shade to him. Uh, and he might have some legit information here. You know, We've got to wait to see it play out. Now, the interesting thing is... Some of the stuff that he noted about this game, like it's been in development since January, uh, and well, after they went independent last month, I guess it would make sense the first game with Microsoft would either be Spyro or Crash. But I want to get into how he breaks it down in his video, because I find this to just to be very, very interesting and also kind of questionable. So let's talk about this. He said, he's had several conversations with developers before PAX East and heard whispers about Spyro 4, whatever whispers are. That's a weird thing we talk about with like, hey, we have talked to developers and they told us something, but we're not allowed to tell you. So it's a whisper. I'm like, no, just straight up say, if you talk to developers and they said it's happening, well, then it's happening. I, I don't, I don't ever really understood that term. But anyways, uh, Beyond that, he said he only got more confirmation when he attended PAX East and had further conversations with more developers. Now you're going to find out it's only one particular developer that's his source on this, but we're going to keep going here. Noted that there were already an official announcement about a week ago by Xbox's Matt Booty that Toys for Bob and Microsoft had reached a deal on their first game, which would be similar to things they had worked on before. So there you go. It similar to things they've worked on before. doesn't mean it is the things they've worked on before. They've worked on Spyro and Crash. The wording, and this comes right from Xbox's Matt Booty, is similar to things, not literally the things we've worked on before, but take that for what you will. That's just Xbox's official word. He claims he heard about this before that article went up, and he had at least one developer confirm it to him. Now, no, no, I don't want to throw any shade on him, but I just got to say... If you're like me and going, man, what a great rumor. This clearly falls into the trust me bro category of rumors. As Canadian guy A has next to no track record. But this became an interesting story to follow as it seems that the PAX East trip was important for confirmation. An event that Toys for Bob was not even at, while their former employers, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard, also didn't really participate. So what developer told you this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of actually curious because they weren't there. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't have friends that were there or that one of them didn't attend Paxis independent of their company. That's always possible. And he could be a very well-connected person and this could all turn out to be true. I'm just trying to provide you the facts of this story. And it's in that I'm really excited for the potential of Spyro 4 and this could be exactly what they're working on. They could also be working on Crash Bandicoot or they could be working on something completely original that Microsoft is funding. There's just a lot of possibilities here. Now, when all these other websites uh, picked up this story, and there's been a few of them, there doesn't appear to be anyone who's corroborated this. So whether it was um, other, I don't know, journalists or whatever you have going on, nothing is official at this point. Uh, it's just this one person and claiming he has this one developer, but he heard whispers before then. It's like, the guy could be right. I don't really know much about him, but I, I don't want to cast doubt, by the way, that PAX East is a way to confirm things. Uh, it's pretty doubtful that he heard directly from a developer from Toys for Bob or Activision Blizzard, but 
it's still one of those things where, hey, we heard stuff from PAX East last year. We reported on it. That stuff ended up being true. Granted, we were talking about Zelda and Nintendo-related stories at an event where there was a Tears of the Kingdom statue and literal Nintendo booths and Nintendo employees there. Uh, so I think it's, you know, and obviously that stuff ended up being true. But, hey, it's not like we can act like we never get things wrong. Remember this beauty of one? Uh, you guys still ask me about that GameStop story. I... Don't really have an explanation for you. There's been no more information to cross my desk about it one way or another. But hey, we don't always get things right either. And we're trying to be better here with this show, Video Game News, and actually deep dive into this stuff. So that's pretty interesting, I suppose. Uh, what I have to say is that with Microsoft willing to let them go third party, uh, there's a high chance that if Spiral 4 is happening, it's probably going to be coming to other platforms, right? Not only have they let Toys for Bob go third party and become an independent developer, they've released a lot of their games. A lot of their plans seem to be about bringing their games to other platforms. So I just kind of want to note here that uh, this game could be coming to Nintendo Switch too. We got some prior Spyro games and prior Crash games and Crash Team Racing. So if this is all legit, and you guys can let me know if you think it is, it's probably coming to Switch too if it just started development this year in January, at least according to that content creator guy, Canadian, eh? So, uh, we will just leave it at that. We'll see what happens. Uh, it's probably not going to be here for two, three, four years anyways, whatever this project officially is. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's also on Switch too. So keep your eyes peeled. Now let's get into something more Nintendo. We started obviously with a Sony and a Microsoft, but what the hell is a Nintendo? You're a Nintendo Prime, man. Well, don't worry. We got some stuff here for you because Pokemon TV has officially ended its services on Nintendo Switch. Do you not know what Pokemon TV was, or do you, and you already knew about this story because it was previously announced? Let's talk about why this is a fascinating thing that it's actually shut down. So we talk a lot around here about Nintendo Switch 2, and before I dive into this further, I want to tell you, we can't actually show anything about this application because it contains Pokemon, anime, and we will be copyright striked. So enjoy some Legends Arceus gameplay that's not even from me because I didn't have time to record any for this video. Services like this ending seem to really support that things are slowly moving on. Now, the Pokemon Company announced back in January that the service that allowed you to watch old Pokemon animated episodes on your Nintendo Switch for free would be shutting down on March 28th. And that's exactly what happened. Sure, the show is available in some free ways on YouTube and also via subscription services like Netflix. But this app was only active for around two and a half years, originally launching in 2021. But there was never a clear statement given on why it's shutting down. I don't really understand it, just to be completely honest here. Looking at my notes, I, I, I see that I could not actually figure out why the heck they decided to shut it down. They're just doing it. But either way, let's get into some of my guesses here. I said, you know, either the user base of the app was really small that it no longer warranted existing, or they just shift focuses behind the scenes to the next platform. They weren't going to continue to support legacy systems. I can't believe I just said it out loud. The Nintendo Switch is a legacy system, yet it's Nintendo's only system in 2024 without a new system announced. I know, I know, I said legacy systems. I, I get it. Look, I'm just referencing the idea that Nintendo Switch will eventually be a legacy platform. I don't blame you if you have your pitchforks and torches ready to take down this ogre. Well, I, I mean me. I'm wearing green, I suppose. It's kind of fitting. But hold on. I said supporting legacy platforms because as a reminder, the online Pokemon servers are going down on April 8th, as are pretty much all 3DS and Wii U servers. And uh, they don't seem to have any way to play it. And the, and the funny thing about those servers going down for all those 3DS titles is it totally isn't going to do anything but promote more piracy, correct? After all, you're going to take your saves, you're going to back them up, you're going to keep playing them on emulators and keep playing those online matches with fan-made online servers and LANs. So... Um, yeah, you know, that's a great way to keep people from piracy Nintendo and Pokemon. Just take away the things that people still love to play because some people don't like the current modern Pokemon games. Fun story. I don't know. I just wanted to throw it out there that's kind of sad it's shutting down, but so is other things and they don't really seem to care that much about legacy. They care about current. You know what's funny about caring about current, by the way? I just got to throw this out here. What about fixing things? What about fixing Scarlet and Violet? That's something I just want to toss out there. You haven't fixed Scarlet and Violet even though you promised you would. I mean, okay, Nintendo said you would, but then you didn't. But uh, then you said you were going to shut this down, and then you did. You seem to have no problem doing things that you say that are negative, but not the things you say that are positive. <sighs> Pokemon's in a precarious place, and it's not because of Pal World. It's just because of Pokemon itself. But I just got to say, after you keep those battles going with your emulators, you know, to, 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 to battle like no one ever was. 
To catch them is my real test, but I will never train them for my cause. Hey, 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 I changed the lyrics. Don't copyright strike me. They still copyright strike with any reference to that original song. I can just, I got some issues with the Pokemon company. You and me, we need to sit in the room and tell you how you should be taking advantage of us content creators for your own benefit, rather than hurting us for making classic references to things we grew up with. Now, are you a game developer? I just got a question for you. This is the, we're getting into story number four here. We're getting deep. Are you a game developer and want to label your upcoming game, t game or title as PlayStation 5 Pro Enhanced? Well, my friend, you absolutely can, only for the price of the Holy Trinity. And no, I didn't make that reference just because Easter was yesterday, although that's a little convenient. That's because while it's being called PlayStation 5 Pro Enhanced, reporter Tom Henderson from Insider Gaming is using this simply to make it more clickable. And there's because the actual name is pretty strange. Internally, and in all this comes from internal leaked documents Tom Henderson ha reportedly has his hands on, it is called Trinity Enhanced. That's right, Trinity. Did I get that right? Yes, Trinity Enhanced. What are you doing, Sony? Uh, because I guess taking advantage of the all-new features of the still-rumored PS5 Pro requires saying the Our Father and tossing out hopes and prayers that he responds. Or maybe it's more like just taking a bow before the goddess Hylia and making a wish upon the Triforce that all your dreams come true. I don't know how many more Trinity references we need here. Let's, uh, let's keep this story going. In order for your game to qualify for this enhanced moniker, it must offer an exclusive graphics mode that applies to three key aspects. And I find these aspects kind of funny because these were also key selling points for the original base model PlayStation 5, which I happen to have. Uh, quite fascinating. Let's, let's, let's see how, what, what you have to do with your game to get the Trinity enhanced sticker on the box. I, I just, I just think this is, this is strange. Well, let's get into these three features. In order for your game to qualify, it must offer an exclusive graphics mode that applies these aspects. Use PSSR to upscale to 4K. Remember, your games are already supposed to be 4K. In fact, there's an 8K on the box for PlayStation 5. I said at the time that 4K, let alone 8K, was pretty wishful thinking, especially natively. And apparently it still is even on the Pro because PSSR is PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution, aka their custom version of FSR, which is super resolution upscaling by AMD and they use AMD tech. So this is just a custom PlayStation version. They're using it to upscale your games to 4K, meaning that you probably still can't run at native 4K for most titles, even on this, even though we were had 4K and 8K on the box. Also, it must constantly hit 60 FPS. Feel like in 2024, that's a pretty big standard with systems like this, but not every game does, including Sony's own games. It also must add in ray tracing or increase current ray tracing effects. You know, something they advertise for the PlayStation 5. That's why I said this is weird. The marketing that you need to use in order, or really the achievements you need to have in order to have Trinity enhanced on your box are just doing the very things they said PlayStation 5 could do in the first place. Almost as if you maybe oversold the original product. Uh, also, it's a little strange talking about PlayStation 5 Pro when we only just got into this generation with exclusive games, taking advantage of the original hardware. You know, the thing I'm actually kind of worried about here is this might lead to developers cutting features from the base PlayStation 5 games to hold them for the PlayStation Pro Enhanced Trinity Edition, whatever they're calling this thing, uh, and just saying that just to get the sticker on the box. I, I it, That is just, to me, a legitimate concern that uh, I, I just, I got a feeling that developers are going to do just because Trinity Enhanced is going to sound better, even though most of the consumers own a PlayStation 5. Now, the thing about those three requirements is we got to sort of air quote the word requirements because you can also get this special Trinity Enhanced badge, assuming that's the final name, we don't know. If the following occurs, and this is where it just gets even better. If you increase your target resolution for a game with a fixed resolution, so let's say it's a 1080p game, you increase to 1440p, you could qualify for this. And that 1440p would have to be obviously on the PlayStation 5 Pro. Increase the maximum resolution for games with a dynamic resolution. Increase the target frame rate over the base game or simply use PlayStation 5 Pro ray tracing effects. You may also end up being allowed to use the label at Sony's discretion by simply drinking the Sony Kool-Aid. I hear they like the flavor, what is that, blue raspberry? Something like that. 
Look, I, this, this to me is just extremely fun uh, and extremely weird at the same time because all the marketing or all the stuff they're using internally to say that your game can use this moniker is what they said you could do with PlayStation 5. I guess we'll have to see if you can actually do it this time. In fact, let's get to the specs because we haven't talked about the specs yet and, and this might give you an idea of what they're targeting and, and what we have going on here. So here's what the specs are supposed to be. According to the internal documents, the PlayStation 5, the PlayStation 5 Pro has 28% faster RAM, 45% faster GPU due to the die size increasing by 67%. However, the CPU has absolutely no changes. Would have liked to see some higher clocks at least, Sony. That would have been nice. But it would be if you're cooler and overclock that thing. I'm just saying. Uh, but yeah, the CPU is going to be the bottleneck of all of this anyway. So if you don't increase all the specs across the board, you know, we'll have to see how much of these specs matter. Of course, the system uh, isn't announced yet. And... The fabled Nintendo Switch Pro also never got officially announced, and we knew a lot of stuff about that, including specs. So I would venture to say that Sony could still just end up not releasing this platform if they don't want to. Seems like they would do it because they did the PlayStation 4 Pro before, so they're more likely to do a Pro system than Nintendo. But I'm just throwing out there that since the system hasn't been announced, we could be talking about a bunch of gobbledygook that doesn't happen. Oh, and we got to toss on the fact that the PlayStation 5 has only recently started to get next-generation games. Of course, we should probably stop calling things next generation. The system is now almost four years old, halfway through its life cycle. Uh, it's just what the current generation is, even though it feels like we haven't even gotten next generation games until now, or at least lately. In fact, what's cool about this, if you want to still use that next generation moniker, is this summer we're getting Visions of Mana on the PlayStation 5 and also the Xbox and PC. What I find fascinating there is that could actually be a preview of a next generation game for Nintendo Switch 2, if that game goes there, because... See what I'm doing there? Switch 2 would be a next generation Nintendo system. Okay, just go with me. I love Visions of Mana, okay? I'm excited for it and I'm buying it on PlayStation because I can't wait. <sighs> now, this next story here is something I typically wouldn't cover here at uh, Nintendo Prime because it ties a little bit into politics and we don't like politics and religious talk around here, but we'll make some jokes here and there. But most of the time we want to stay out of it, but this is important because this involves video games in a major way. So Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, I'm sure you've heard of him, he's sort of in the news every day, has put together a team to look into creating its own series of exclusive video game consoles, games, cloud gaming services. And when he says consoles, he means home console and handheld. Hey, Nintendo, we're not leaving you out of our, our, our eyes here. Now, the reason is, in case you're all unaware, is that all these major players, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, have all pulled out of Russia with the ongoing war. They're not in support of what's happening there, and they do not want to bring their games or systems there anymore, even though there are some, obviously some people there that have it. Also, some of you, even the shops themselves have been shut down by some of these console places. So uh, just throwing out there that this is why Vladimir Putin's even talking about this. Why would he even care? Well, because their consumers can't buy video games quite easily in that country anymore, let alone play them on anything but PC. So that's all cool. Well, how do we know this information? And this is where we got to be a little careful. There's a lot of propaganda out there right now involving Russia. But this all came from a Russian newspaper known as Commerçant. Commerçant? I'm, look, I'm not going to bother to actually figure out how to pronounce this, and I normally would. Um, but I'm only mildly sorry that I didn't figure this out because I don't really know what I can believe when it comes from uh, the Russian news sources. Uh, but I do know that snapping their fingers and making this happen right now is pretty impossible, and they seem to recognize that too. That's why this is apparently part of a 10-year plan. That's right. Vladimir Putin says within 10 years, they have plan to have their own systems, games, and stuff. Government-ran video games and video game systems. That's... Look, I don't care if it's uh, Russia, I don't care if it's the United States, I don't care if it's the UK, China. Uh, Government-ran entertainment media. That sounds like a real winner. <laughs> That's where we're going to leave that story. Uh, our last story now deals with Unicorn Overlord. You guys remember that tactical strategy RPG? <sighs> well, we have some sales data for this game. It sold 500,000 units, but... How did we find out about this? Was there a press release? Was there an official tweet? Uh, was there, you know, just anything at all? Was there like a major news outlet who did an interview? Well, no, we found out because of Wario64 over on Twitter slash X. Now, who is Wario64? He's someone who shares a lot of 
um, merchandise stuff, like when new merch becomes available, it goes in stock for different video game companies, whether it's physical editions of games or collector stuff. And he just shares it with a bunch of affiliate links, makes some money. Lots of people follow him because, hey, he's really good at it. He's probably even botted up at this point. It's probably a bot mostly running the account. But what I find interesting about all this stuff is he shared this as a news story because there's no money to be made on this yet because the game's already out and he didn't even provide an affiliate link to buy Unicorn Overlord. But how does this person or this bot or whatever it is have access to this sales data that has not been reported anywhere? Well, it's because he links to a video that was put up nine days ago by the actual developers of the game about Unicorn Overlord on the official Japanese account. Now remember, Unicorn Overlord was made by Vanillaware. They make a lot of these strategy RPG type games. They do a very good job, published by Sega and Alice. That's awesome, but what doesn't make any sense to me is that this is a nine day old video, so it took this long for this information to even be found and come out, because again, it's on a hidden unlisted video on YouTube. Yes, a hidden unlisted video. Was this for an internal board meeting that they had this? Is the information in the video even accurate? Like, is it unlisted because the information isn't accurate? I'm very confused on what's going on here and why we, if they've hit that 500,000 mark, why they haven't put it out there. And this was nine days ago. The game came out on March 8th, on the 8th. So you go back nine days, we're like a week out from when the game came out and they couldn't have given us the data then. It's, it, it's a little strange to me. I have a feeling, you know, whether it's Vanillaware or Sega, Atlas, whoever, might be in wake of this news come out and make a social media announcement on the actual sales. Uh, so while the headlines are all saying it sold 500,000 units, maybe, <laughs> I mean, that's what the video says that's hidden and not supposed to be viewed, but then also maybe it sold more because that was nine days ago. So even if the information's accurate, it's probably sold more since then. Maybe it's at 600,000 now. So the game got really good reviews as well, so I wouldn't be surprised if it sold even more after launch week. I'm just throwing out there that it's a very strange story, but it is one that we have, and that is uh, the last story of video game news. So we're going to do this little last segment here. No timers, no fancy anything. I just want to say thank you guys for being here. Hopefully you continue to enjoy these longer, more in-depth uh, video game coverage I want to do every single day. We're trying to launch these videos Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 10 a.m. They're going to be as up-to-date as we humanly can. We're doing most of the legwork the night before, but if there's like a breaking story that happens at 7, 8 a.m., uh, we'll try to get it in. If it happens at 9 a.m., it's going to be too late for us to add it in. We'll have to do a separate video on that. We're also still going to do individual videos on big stories, like say Nintendo announces a Nintendo Direct today in like a couple hours at noon. Hey, we're going to get a video out about that long before we get the next video game news out. Although, we'll have our more in-depth conversation and deep diving into all the details surrounding it and any possible leaks and all that would obviously happen in the following day. So we're going to have a lot of fun with this stuff. I hope you enjoyed this new new style. Uh, no secret here, we're inspired by hardware news, by Gamers Nexus, hence the timers. And this isn't even our final background. This is an old banner. It's kind of retro, retro to me anyways, E3 2021. We're going to have uh, some new stuff going on behind us tomorrow, in fact, because we're just waiting on things to arrive. Whew. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I'm going to catch you guys in the next video.